Welcome to episode 33 of the series about security podcast for April 1st, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined by my pirate counterparts, uh, Keith Watson and Mike Hill. And uh, Keith has the first article today. So if you were paying attention last week, you may have heard about a little war going on on the internet. And that is basically the spammers attacking a site called Spamhaus, S-P-A-M-H-A-U-S, which is a non-profit company whose mission in life is basically to eliminate, eliminate spam on the internet. And... Spam House has been uh, providing lists of IP addresses for known spammers. And the idea is that when you get an email, you can see what server routed it to you. And if that IP address of that server is, comes from a known spamming site, you can just basically drop that email because it's probably a spam message. Spam House has been basically collecting these IP lists over time, and these are uh, lists that uh, we use internally here to kind of block a good chunk of email that we know to be spam because of its origination. So they have several lists. There's the Spam House block list, which is like basically the IP addresses I've mentioned. Um, There's some other stuff known as a register of known spam operations and the drop list, which is the do not route or peer list. And this is a way of having um, IP address IP address blocks that are controlled by criminals and spammers. And you really don't want to accept traffic from these guys. Those lists are maintained by Spam House. And this all started, uh, at least the denial of distributed denial of service attack started when there was one particular company known as the Cyber Bunker uh, got added to the Spam House list, and they did not take uh, too kindly to this happening. And through using a uh, a problem known as an amplification attack in DNS, uh, basically they directed some relatively simple and small DNS requests using open DNS resolvers that support recursive queries, take small requests, spoof the address to point to spam house, and then that would generate a much larger response. So you could basically take a very small request, such as they list a, you know, less than 30 bytes of requests, and that would generate a 3,000 byte response. So if you get a lot of this, you can generate a significant amount of traffic for a little bit of investment. And this has uh, basically pushed the attack scale up to roughly 300 gigabits per second of traffic that was measured um, heading into the Spam House site. Now what this effectively did was take the website down. However, it did not really block the active operations that they support in supplying these IP lists for known spammers. So, in a sense, the attack generated a lot of publicity more than it affected the operations of the group. So, that's part of the issue uh, in terms of this particular attack. Now, the problem is that you can launch a fair number of these DNS amplification attacks against a variety of uh, sites online. And and you can do it for not a lot of investment in in making this deluge of stuff happen. So there's a, a problem in that on the internet we have a lot of DNS servers that are open for anybody to query. And if those open resolvers support recursive queries, then they can be used as an origination for these attacks. And so the biggest way to solve this is to go out to any recursive open DNS server and change the configuration so they no longer support their openness or to at least eliminate their recursive capability. And it's really a simple change to the configuration file in in bind, for example, 
Um, and we went back and reviewed our own configuration and found we'd turned off recursive queries about 10 years ago. So our own servers here at Sirius were not, would, could not be used in an amplification type attack. Our website's certainly vulnerable to it, but hey, our, our, at least our DNS server is not going to be party to that type of attack. So there's the, this is kind of a significant issue because this could be, this type of attack could be used to launch a, a, a distributed denial of service attack against a wide variety of sites online. And so we've provided a few links in the, in the show notes that talk about, you know, the specific attack on spam house and also some mitigation techniques um, specifically spam house worked with uh, cloudflare which is a company that s kind of specializes in building reliable websites i guess and um, basically routed some of that traffic using the anycast method and distributed the large amount of data across several data centers that they could more easily review each type of traffic to determine if it had attack uh, signatures or characteristics of the attack or whether it was legitimate traffic. So, so, so I, I, have a, I have a question. Would we say that this attack was a result of misconfigured DNS, DNS servers or is this something that can continue to happen if, even if uh, the DNS servers were, were, were fixed? Is this, a, is this a result of a misconfiguration or something configured to do more than it should have done? It appears that there's a default capability within DNS servers to allow recursive queries. However, most configurations by default, when they're installed, have it enabled and most people don't change that. Um, so. I would say that misconfigured DNS servers facilitate the attack. However, you could create your own open resolvers as you know in a you know botnet type distrib distribution across the internet and build your own infrastructure to launch these attacks. So it's kind of a combination of the way the protocol works and the fact that by default there are a significant number of open resolvers out there that do recursive queries. So it's a two-part problem. One facilitated by the fact that most DNS servers are not configured optimally to prevent this type of thing. And and my understanding is even though this didn't take this their their um, their uh, actual blocking service offline, but the blocking uh, service that they provide, I believe, uses DNS itself in order to function. You basically your your uh, they, they, you basically look up uh, the IP address of the uh, of the system that is uh, sending mail to you, and and, and if it is in their uh, DNS uh, thing, then it is considered blocked. I believe is right. Is the way yeah, it works. I think that's one way to use it. That's probably the way the most people do it, given the the fairly low overhead normally of what DNS requests are. Do you uh, anticipate that um, that this war has ended at all yet for Spam House? Um, it looks like they contacted a, a third party, Cloudflare, to help them mitigate uh, these types of attacks. Um, but it looks like they have a, a fair number of enemies that still want to kind of bring them down and shut them down. So, do you think this is um, that this has been resolved for them, or they're going to face future attacks? Um, and maybe more significant attacks that throw even more data at them and try to knock their site offline. I'm sure that uh, given their enemies, they may receive future attacks. Um, what those future attack characteristics are, I don't know that we know that yet. Um, if you recall, a long time ago we had issues where there were distributed denial of service attacks against CNN and New York Times and, and Amazon and quite a few other large companies on the internet and those issues related to that attack have never been resolved so there's always a possibility that future distributed denial of service attacks could occur we have developed various mitigation techniques that are somewhat effective now but they're not a complete solution so the issue still remains in the protocols that we're using just as they remain in the problems with the DNS in this particular case. 
Well, and Spam House isn't without its controversy. Controversy. I, I mean, I, I believe I used to use them, and I stopped using them because they were, uh, I'd say, in a little bit kind of trying to force companies out of business or force them um, to change their views by blocking them when they hosted some maybe nasty sites but also some legitimate sites so they I, I, they've they've been in the news before blocking things that you know were, were somewhat questionable and maybe being a little bit more you know in the advocacy and political type realm maybe more than they should have been and a little bit uh, kind of biased uh, I don't know if they're like that anymore. I have absolutely no idea, but I recall that in the past, and so they they've been in the news before, and and I don't think this is the last time. I mean, we're dealing with, you know, sc scammers and criminals and things like that typically when it comes to who they're trying to block. Right. Um, I'm not completely familiar with their their past dealings. I'm sure that anytime you block anybody on the internet, there's going to be some dispute over whether it's legitimate or not. So um, I'm sure these guys are, are just one of many organizations out there that have a lot of people that rather not see them around. <laughs> so I don't think they're unique in that respect. Okay, I'll uh, move on to the next article of the day, and this is on uh, Apple. Um, we've talked about Apple a lot recently um, in previous podcasts, and um, a little over a week ago, they actually uh, just released two-factor verification, uh, which is, is a great step forward for Apple. Unfortunately, the very next day, it was discovered that there was a flaw in their uh, password reset page, uh, the I Forgot service. Uh, this flaw allowed you to bypass the security questions associated with the user account. So essentially you could reset any password if you had the correct email address associated with their Apple account and their date of birth. Uh, so not real strong security in order to uh, uh, reset the password. Um, Apple did take the site down when, once this was discovered. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people rushed to enable two-factor uh, verification on their Apple accounts, and um, there was a three-day window implemented, so it would take three days for it to take effect. So essentially, there was a three-day window there uh, where users that had implemented two-factor verification um, could still have their accounts reset. Um, now, Apple uh, did respond fairly quick. Like I said, they took the site down, and they have patched it, and the site is back online, and that um, that security hole has been uh, fixed. Uh, it, it seemed very much to me kind of like a back door because uh, with, with a specially crafted link, you could just bypass uh, those security protections. Um, it, it's interesting how Apple implemented their, uh, their two-factor verification as well. I, I did... Uh, when I saw this, I set it up on my account, and uh, what you can do with it is, they gate, they basically they give you, um, you you can tie it to your Apple devices. You can also enter your your mobile phone, so you can have multiple uh, uh, pieces of authentication that serve as your second factor. Uh, so if you have an iPod Touch, an iPhone, an iPad, uh, you can use all those devices. And, and when you actually log in and it asks you for that second factor, you can indicate which device you'd like that to be sent to. Uh, there's also, um, I'm trying to think exactly what it's called. Uh, there's a, like a one-time password also associated with it. It's not, that's not what they call it, but it's, it's another piece of, uh, a verification. I'm just looking for the right word here. Um, but basically, it, it also serves as, as a part of that second factor in case you don't have, um, in case you don't have your phone available. I, I apologize for not remembering this. Where is it? Um, is it similar yeah. to the Google uh, Google for um, what backup? Recovery key. It, 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 yeah, recovery, recovery key. Thank key. you. It's similar, except 
with Google you get like a list of 10 I believe you can use one time in this case it's more like a recovery key in that it's always valid um, so you you store that when you set up your second factor so the way Apple does it actually is you have to have two of three so you have to have your password and then either the four digit code that's sent to your device or this recovery key um, furthermore if you happen to forget your password you can still get into your account with that recovery key and your uh, mobile device that sends you the four digit code um, so that's one way they've implemented slightly different than other implementations we've seen um, the other thing is they've only implemented it for certain settings in your uh, Apple account so uh, when you go to the site just to log in you don't have to enter that second factor you just have to enter your password uh, where it comes into play is when you're changing your account settings or that you're visiting the uh, app store then they require that second uh, second piece of verification so um, you know that I thought this was an interesting article uh, just because they took a slightly different approach w with the way they did their two-step verification and, and the fact that they don't really make you use it in all instances but I guess what they consider to be the um, most likely cases where someone would want to steal your authentication you know app purchases or, or changing your account settings that's where they uh, make you enter that type of information so I was just curious what you guys uh, thought of this approach well, to me, it sounds like with the recovery key that you mentioned that Apple doesn't quite understand what two-factor authentication means because that, to me, sounds like a password, just a different, just a, one that they randomly generated instead of one you generated yourself if it continues to be valid. Um, with Google's recovery key, um, those are, are passwords in a, in a sense, but once you use them they are no longer valid so and they're not recovery keys they're backup codes right so if you don't codes. have your device with you and right. you, need, you can you know put them in your wallet or whatever you'll have so them available to you the recovery key that continues to be valid even after use seems to me like it is just yet another password and not a, a second factor in, in a sense it could be compromised through whatever means via uh, uh, logger or, or whatever uh, on your computer and then they suddenly have your password and your recovery key or, or, or whatever and and they have the access to your account the, the idea with the with the second factor is you're dealing with one-time passwords things that will change if they're captured oh well they're not going to be they're not valid anymore and uh, that's kind of the point of two-factor authentication in, in the way that, that Google's doing it and such like that. They're using one-time passwords that are essentially tied to a device. Um, so I don't quite think Apple understands what they're doing at this point and, and from, from the description I've heard of it. Well, I don't know if that's the case. I think it's more likely because you know, the, the Apple guys are fairly smart, and I think most likely they're trying to figure out how to introduce a two-factor type authentication system without angering customers too much. I mean, there's a there's a there's this thought that if you if you anger your customers, they're going to find another company to do business with, right? And we know that Apple fans are fairly loyal, so I don't know if that's exactly the problem. However, if you increase the complexity that and the headaches involved with having a customer have to use a two-factor two-step verification system and you make it so hard that they don't want to use it you're gonna have a lot of complaints about it and that's going to defeat the purpose of having a two-factor system now we may say well you know they didn't do this right or they didn't do that right and maybe they didn't but I think part of the discussion should be why they chose the particular steps they did so that they could introduce this idea to customers who may not have any idea what two-step verification is you know they're Apple customers not Google customers although they might be you know, most of us are and try to introduce that in a way that can still be useful to somebody and not make it so difficult they can't use it at all however reading through the fact here it looks very complicated and it may be, it may seem complicated to me because I know how the Google 
two-step verification system works and this is just called the same thing but works slightly different so it seems more complex I don't know if that's true or not but um, so we could we could argue and say oh yeah they don't know what they're doing and the fact is they may have made the choices they did for a specific customer reason and that's not necessarily implemented uh, the right way let's say so I don't know if we could say well they're a bunch of idiots so well, I wouldn't well, make that my, leap. My point is that if you take out the the uh, <clears throat> the phone thing the SMS message and you take the recovery key and that doesn't change and your password then it is no longer two-factor authentication it's a single factor you have two passwords so yeah well, true I could see that's that that's essentially what I'm saying yeah well I, I think they did this uh, for their for the reasons you've specified Keith I think it is for uh, user convenience uh, but but interestingly I think the casual users are unlikely to set up two-factor verification anyway um, you know despite how friendly they try to make it and, and um, I guess I tend to I think doing it differently than the way others do it just makes it harder to understand as well um, you know they they specify you know protect this recovery key keep it separate I mean the idea is you know you take this key you, you put it in your safe deposit box or you lock it up in a safe and you only use that in the event of an emergency that's how they detail it uh, however a, a user that doesn't understand that might just store it right on their desktop and then if they leave their phone laying around and they're a casual user they don't have a lock screen boom there, there's your two pieces of uh, verification that you need to get into the account and then you can change the users password you can turn off the two-factor um, I, I I think it's interesting I, I haven't looked enough into it to see you know if once you use your recovery key do they force you to make generate a new recovery key at that point in time I, I didn't see anything that indicated that they would um, so I think that's I think that's where the concern comes from is they did it a little differently and it may not be that it's necessarily a bad thing but it's hard for folks to understand exactly how it's all going to work and, and how um, how that helps protect how does that recovery key help protect your account um, versus um, you know th does it just give another way for your account to be broken into well <clears throat> I have one more comment um, I, I mentioned two-factor authentication and Apple is not calling it two-factor authentication they're calling it two-step verification not two-factor authentication right and that's so, the same thing that Google calls theirs too it's two-step verification right well I think Google's is quite a bit more like two-factor authentication <clears throat> because you do need your device and your password essentially so I guess maybe that's why they called it that but but they're not they're not saying it's two-factor authentication they're saying there are two items you need in order to verify your account so right and you know if you've ever looked at the the Facebook method for account recovery um, it's very complex and it's complex for a very good reason they have very they have significant challenges in trying to verify who you are when somebody else claims to be the same person that you are and has the same username and same password they just happen to be on a different IP address so how do you go back and you verify and figure out who the real person is in an electronic space based on only information that they've provided to you or you've gathered about them over time and so the Apple recovery procedure is pretty complex but I don't think it's any less complex than the Facebook one if you've ever tried that and I've, I've written about it so I've done it and it's not easy <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily make sense to me from the outside I don't know why they have the rules they have I can guess why they have those rules but since I don't know how it works in the back end exactly it's hard for me to say well that's terrible you know because there's a lot of verification a lot of figure out who this person is and what they know and what they should know in order to determine who they are talking to when they say okay you now get ownership of this particular account and so the recovery procedures are challenging and so 
a lot of times you're going to see these kind of weird and convoluted rules for two-step verification too. And they're all based on this idea that we have two or more people claiming to be one person. How do we figure out who the right one is? And have no other information. Can't meet them face to face. You know, it's a challenge. Yeah. Well, um, despite some of these concerns about how Apple implemented it, I would encourage folks to sign up for it and um, to do as Apple suggests and protect that recovery key. I, I think it's uh, I think it's much stronger than not having it enabled. Um, but I think it'll just be one of those things. Time will tell. Um, I guess you know the only thing is. We, we've seen Apple come up more recently. Um, like I said, you know, they had the passcode lock issue. They had, you know, just where they released this two-step, and then the vulnerability was found on their password reset site. Um, so I hope this pans out well for them. You know, that it's not something they'll have to go back to at some point and and correct or change. Um, but but only time will tell. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's better than nothing. Um, and I, from the way this recovery key was described to me, it should be saved off, put somewhere, and never used unless you absolutely need it. Um, I have used the Google uh, recovery stuff before, and I, I don't have any problems with that. I mean, I know that's one-use stuff, so if I use it, I, I don't care. But it seems like this key is absolute emergency. Don't use it unless you really, really need it. Uh, type things. So, and and we'll see. Apple seems to be willing to change things when they don't work. So we'll see how it goes. Um, and with that, we'll uh, end the this episode. Uh, thank you to Keith Watson and Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.